All right, folks, we're going to do start this meeting, call it to order, and we're going to do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. Really close standing. So welcome everybody. I know it's hot. I just want to start the meeting off um, and recognize the tragic passing of Max Julian, who was a former student here at Little Compton and at Wilbur. Um, so if we could have a moment of silence for Max, uh, I think that'd be appropriate. All right, thank you. So two is a consent agenda. Any member like to withdraw an article from the consent agenda? Let me know now. I uh, would, Patrick, please. We do, we've got one. Go ahead, Mike. The, and I'm sorry, I'm trying to get to it, but the one on the attendance, please, the um, enrollment, I'm sorry. Is that two what, two point what? I'm trying to get to 2. it. 2.8 enrollment, that is taken out, okay, Mike? Anything else? Anyone else want to take something out? Okay, I will accept the motion to approve the rest of the consent agenda. Do I have a motion? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Great. Uh, roll call, please, Mariah. Holly Allen. Absent. Tina Aya. Aye. Mike Rocha. Aye. Rita Kenahan. Aye. Patrick McHugh. Aye. Let us know if we're echoing too, by the way. Any, any, any of the three? Yeah, a little bit. Uh, let um, Jonathan know if it gets bad or if it's annoying to anyone. We're experimenting. We're a little experimentation going on. All right. I have uh, 2.8 up on the board. Mike, go ahead. I'd just like to know where do we stand with this compared to where we were at the beginning of the year when we first started as far as the enrollment from September to now, please. Right. I don't have that. I, I don't have that information at my fingertips right now. Um, but I can definitely circle back to you tonight after the meeting and grab it. I'm gonna circle back. I got an offer of a circle back. Do you accept the circle circle back offer? That's fine. And that's accepted. So I will consider a motion to uh, approve 2.8. Do I have a motion? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, can I have a roll call, please? Holly Allen. Absent. Anna Aya. Aye. Mike Rocha. Aye. Rita Kenahan. Aye. Patrick McHugh. Aye. Okay, so we are on 3.1 Spotlight. I think that should say Principal Spotlight. Maybe someone forgot to put that. Uh, it's okay. No, for you all tonight. <laughs> That's a joke. Okay, didn't go over well. That, very good, thank you. Go right ahead. All right, we have a lot of events um, going on in the next couple of weeks, and I'm um, proud to say that some of them are going, beginning to look more like our pre-pandemic um, events. This coming Friday, we have the second flu shot clinic, flu shot, the second COVID shot clinic at Wilbur. Next Monday night is the eighth grade semi-formal, which will be held on site and outdoors. Um, we're very happy to bring that back. And we have a lot of excited kids to attend the semi-formal. Next Wednesday on 616, we will be having field day. This year it will be K to eight, all, all grade levels will participate. Both our seventh and our eighth grade students will have leadership roles. Um, the eighth grade missed out on that experience last year. So um, they'll be doing um, some of the leadership pieces that um, were involved in this. You, it, historically, it's been the seventh graders that were kind of in charge of field day. But since the eighth grade missed that, we're kind of rolling all of the kids into the event. Um, on field day, Chartwells will be providing a picnic lunch for all students. 
Um, just as of this morning, the fourth grade is proud to say that they will be doing their parade of history on the front lawn on Friday, June 18th. Um, on Sunday, June 20th, the uh, eighth grade memory slideshow and the eighth grade award ceremony will be shared via video. Um, and then on 621 at 6 p.m., we will be having a in-person graduation on the front lawn. And we had Ty Sells, a, pre a presenter from Youth to Youth International, come on June 2nd. It was his first live in-person presentation since the pandemic, and we were very happy to host him for our middle school students. So we have a lot of exciting things going on. 621 at 6 p.m.? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Same, same uh, format as last year? We are going to do, it will be more of a sit down. Um, we yeah. are going to have um, the graduates, uh, the school committee and two parents for each student will get seating on the front lawn and then any additional guests will be able to sit across the street. So everybody will be able to watch. Yeah. And we Great. will take the sound system out. And this is kind of a, a, a hybrid between going full um, full in person, like we've done pre-pandemic, and and not and the car parade from last year. Julie, okay. Any questions for the uh, principal? Mm -hmm. I, I yes, go ahead, Hannah. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I got Hannah right next to me, so I saw the hand. Go ahead, Hannah. Why don't you mute? Am I on mute? I'm not on mute. No mute. Oh, you want me to mute? Gotcha. I'm sorry. <laughs> go ahead. Um. I just wanted to ask about the parade of history. Is that in person or is that um, online? It will be in person. What they're going to do is they're going to have, um, I don't remember the exact time off the top of my head, but Friday, that Friday afternoon at 1.30, they'll be doing um, the parade of history. For those of you who don't know, it's a fourth grade tradition where the um, students dress up as a character, as a, as a person that they have done some informational writing on. And then they, they, present as that person to the audience. It's always a big hit. Um, kids work very hard at it. Um, it's going to be at 1.30, it's going to be outside on the lawn. Um, we're asking families to limit themselves to two people so that we can do it in a safe manner. What they're going to do is in the morning, their dress rehearsal, they're going to tape that um, so that we can share the recording of the dress rehearsal with parents who may not be able to be live and in person. So they'll get a little bit of both worlds this way. Great. That's exciting. I remember the holiday tea when I was in fourth grade. So that'll be really fun to see. Thank you. Good, Mike. Are you limiting um, parents or guests for the graduation as to how many they can uh, invite the students? What we're going to do is limit it to two on the, the side where the, um, where the students will be. And then the, the seating um, on Pikes Peak will be, people will bring their own seating, either a, a lawn blanket or chairs. So each student will get two tickets to, to the graduation. And then um, if we need to, if we have a multiple families, uh, you know, as a household with a, a a unique circumstance will give them four tickets. But they're not, so they're not being limited as far as on Pikes Peak. Correct. So grandparents, siblings, um, you know, they could, they could bring a, a fairly good size contingent, but just um, in order to keep the size where the, the location where the kids are going to be to a reasonable size, we're limiting that to two, but yes, they, the visitors can, can be across the street watching. And you could hear pretty well last year when we had the sound set up. Okay, thank you. All right, is that it for the principal? Okay, great. For superintendent report, the Wilbur McMahon School Hybrid Learning Model. Go ahead, Lori. I have air conditioning over here. Sorry, everybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Nearly all of our students are back in person, uh, some joining us these past few weeks even, so welcome back. I'd say we're about at 98% capacity um, in terms of our full enrollment. 
Last week, as you all know, uh, Governor McKay did lift the outdoor mask mandate for vaccinated and unvaccinated individuals. I wish he had, many of us wish he had waited <laughs> until the end of the school year, but um, politicians, no offense. It was not an easy decision to make, but district and school staff did convene and discuss, and we determined we would give it a try because I think, yeah, might have given in to pandemic fatigue. Um, and so far, so good. And of course, students can continue to wear masks and so can staff if they elect to do so. Here we are, June 9th, and we're headed towards the finish line. We have 10 more school days left. Uh, this has been a most memorable year, remarkable for both its challenges and some really delightful revelations like uh, the joy that comes with outdoor learning and the daily displays of strength and resilience among students and staff. Um, I can't close this year without emphasizing that enough. And so we have these miracles, these sort of silver linings unfolding um, just about every day during this uh, dreadful pandemic, and we're holding on to these silver linings as we are knee deep in planning for next year already. Um, we, um, oh, what? Oh, I, I, uh, it's not mine. Um, we are door glovers, definitely all of us on the screen. And um, so we will be reconvening our reopening team. Um, and we will be writing another reopening plan for next year's um, not hybrid learning year, but an in-person learning year with some restrictions. So um, that's where we are with our Wilbur McMahon School year of hybrid learning. It's almost over. We're planning for a fresh start. Any questions for uh, the superintendent on uh, 4-1? Not seeing any. Great. So human resources. We have Carolyn Sedgwick. We slide her in here. Are we doing that update if, if you don't mind? Oh, um, sure. Go ahead. Sorry. That's okay. Um, she and I are a tag team and sharing no, an no office. Problem. No problem. <laughs> but she um, is part of the panelists tonight, and, and that is a probably a welcome breath of fresh air for Carolyn. Uh, there's a history of longevity in our very precious school when it comes to employees. And in this case, um, a retirement, a new retirement that I'm announcing, there's a history of legacy. Mr. Christopher Osborne Sr. has announced his intent to retire after nearly 45 years of service as a custodian at Wilbur McMahon School. His father, John, preceded him in retirement from the same position, and his son, Chris Jr., remains on our custodial staff. We wish Chris Sr. all the best in his well-deserved retirement after decades of dedicated work um, on behalf of the school community. We salute you, Mr. Christopher Osborne Sr. And um, so at this time, I think we should all sort of give him a round of applause. If he's not on, I will send him the video. Uh, and there's a reason why employees rarely leave the Little Compton School Department. It is a terrific place to work. So spread the word, we're hiring. As a result of two retirements in the custodial department, we're looking for to hire two full-time custodians. The postings are active on School Spring and also on the school's Facebook page. So push the word out, it's a great place to work, competitive wages and a sweet benefits package that all hardworking educators deserve. That is the HR update for the district. Thank you. Four three Office for Civil Rights determination of the implementation of the resolution agreement from 2010. So we're going in the wayback machine here. <laughs> and, we uh, are. Yeah. So go right ahead. I mean, so often, you know, we um, the district mentions the Department of Education on the state level, and every now and then, the, the U.S. Department of Education's long arm does reach into districts. Um, and that's what I'm going to summarize um, right now. In March of this year, 2021, my office received a voicemail from an attorney at the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights, known as OCR or the OCR, regarding his need to follow up on a case from two 
2010 regarding his need um, for more information. It seems the case related to the 504 process was never fully closed. Uh, the OCR is known to move at a glacial pace. I'm sure Attorney Clough will um, agree with me on that, but 11 years is a bit much. Um, and according to our records, this is the only OCR complaint ever filed against Wilbur McMahon School and investigated um, by that body. Great news alert on Wednesday, May 26th, after a few months of corrective action on the part of attorney Anderson and my office, I received a monitoring closure letter from the OCR stating they've completed its monitoring the implementation of the 2010-2010 resolution agreement and informed us that they were closing their investigation because the district had indeed proved it committed to take steps to resolve the allegations from 11 years ago. So in March, we hear from the US Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights saying that you know, we have a, a case that was not closed, um, steps that you know, were likely taken but never recorded. And so attorney Anderson and I had to go back and in the way back machine. And we had to communicate quite a bit with the uh, OCR um, we had to tweak some of our policies and also offer some PD, which we did to our staff and um, cases closed. Thank yeah. you for that. Any questions for anyone on that? Great, thank you for clearing that one up. Oh, finance report, it's, it's right on the bottom. So little, I almost missed it. It's on the bottom. Finance report, go ahead, John McNamee. Since the superintendent did such a good job at the HR report, I thought she could do the finance report as well, too. Okay, great. The finance report, the superintendent spends <laughs> money like it's what? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, we, All we've, yours, completed, <laughs> we've completed um, 11 months at this point in time, and uh, I'm still projecting a small deficit, but what's happening now is a lot of the... Uh, uh, year-end invoices are coming in and uh, we should be doing hopefully a little bit better than that. We are going to be paying the last big payroll, which includes five um, certified payrolls this coming Friday. So by um, the end of the month, we'll have all the payrolls in and um, certainly by the July meeting, I'll have a better handle on uh, where we're gonna wrap up the year end at, at this point in time. I mean, there are still some expenditures in there that I've got to ferret out that can be charged to grants. Um, and um, some of the items that we do have budgeted are gonna be uh, under our uh, projections. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping that we can uh, show uh, break even probably more of a small surplus for the for the upcoming year. Um, but there hasn't been any significant changes since uh, since last month's report in terms of uh, any unusual expenses at this point. Any questions for John McMahon? Not seeing any, John, thank you. Six uh, committee reports. Uh, six one policy subcommittee Hannah or um, Polly, do we are we waiting to do this or you want to speak about something now? Let's wait until it's um, on the discussion items, please. Uh, sounds good. Portsmouth School Committee liaison report would be Rita. Yes, thank you. Um, right, a couple of Portsmouth School Committee meetings took place. I'll give you the highlights. Um, Lots of detail on graduation, proms, uh, recognitions, retirements there as well. Uh, many details on the end of year activities. So lots going on there in the schools. Um, a big event is actually happening tonight. The school committee approved their $20 million school improvement capital budget. And so they're going to the town council tonight to see if it gets approval. So. That will mean some nice changes to uh, this, the Portsmouth school system. Yeah, everybody's got their fingers crossed, so that's tonight. Um, and then it, it will result in, there's a, a meeting date change. So the next school committee for, uh, meeting for Portsmouth is June 29th. So if people are following that or attending, just make 
uh, just be aware they've changed that. But everything else seems to be going pretty well over there. Thank you, Rita. You're welcome. 6-3 Town Recreation Committee, there's something to report out. Wellness Committee, Rita, back to you. Committee, we have another meeting coming up very soon. Um, we have, um, there were a couple of grants I think we were looking at. I don't know if we've made any progress, um, but we'll have to see about that. I don't know, Sonia, do you know if we, yes? Still looking into them. I'll report back at the wellness meeting. Yeah, yeah. I just think things have been going so well. We review the food. I mean, everybody is so well fed at Wilbur School. We couldn't be more pleased. Um, but of course, watching the obesity rates simultaneously. And so we're doing a good job there. Um, and I don't know what's going to happen in the fall. Is there any sense that we'll be getting the um, free meals for everybody in the fall like we did this year? Well, we may be getting them this summer. We just got that today at a district meeting. Um, it's oh, great. Meeting. Yeah. So I think more information will filter in. John, do you have anything other than the summer program that just fell on our lap? Happily, we're going to follow through. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's we'll be going back to the regular um, free and reduced applications in the fall. That's what they're they're looking at at this point in time, but. Um, I don't know if there's going to be some money available on one of the, like the American rescue funds that will allow for uh, some additional uh, food service throughout the year. That would be nice because that's worked out uh, great for all the districts involved. Yeah, it has. Yeah. So this summer we're in the process of doing that and my office okay. and um, John, Carolyn and I working with Chartwell. So Fingers crossed that we can get that airborne. Um, Indeed. Yeah, right. as soon as possible. Yeah. yeah, so other than that, um, there has there was a committee put together and I volunteered, so I've been working on, um, we're redoing the um, health and wellness policy for the state. So that's been coming along. Well, I'm sure I'll, I'd like to report on that once it's um, completed. And that's about it. Thank you. Seven. One, uh, discussion items. Information from Rhode Island Association of School Committees pertaining to school committee member participation in subcommittee meetings are Kennehan. So I'm glad, uh, Rita, that you brought this up last meeting because I, I missed it, that there is a lot of information that we can gain from the Rhode Island Association of School Committees and that we don't have to ask our lawyer and, and pay money. So I missed that. So what did you find out? So again, just um, we're all members of RIAS, the Rhode Island Association of School Committees, and they we used to go, I think some of us on this call went to the uh, annual meeting in person at Bryant University uh, through the Hassenfeld Institute for Public Leadership, and you get so many contact hours too when you um, attend that event, that day-long event. Um, so there's wonderful resources there. And I did happen to connect with Tim Duffy, who happens to be the executive director currently. And a lot of you probably know him. He has quite a history in education in the state. So I asked him about specifically because the question came up about uh, whether or not a school committee member can speak at a subcommittee meeting. And so it was a good question, a valid question. And, and there seemed to be three examples where a school committee member attending a subcommittee uh, could be uh, speaking at it. So the first is um, if we are, if we deem ourselves ex officio, in other words, if we as a school committee say that we're by our virtue of our office or our official position, because we're members of the school committee, we have a right to speak at any subcommittee meeting, we would have to decide that as a committee. So if we decide we're ex officio, then there's no problem speaking. Uh, the other instance would be if you're invited by the subcommittee, and then you certainly would be there for a purpose and you would be welcome to speak. And then if there is the third issue is if the public is invited to speak, you can speak as part of the public. So that's what I learned does anyone have questions about it? So that's interesting that uh, 
if the school committee, this board of five people, want to make a policy, I guess I don't know what it is to decide to say, hey, we're in, we're in an ex officio and we're able to speak at subcommittee meetings. Period. So that's interesting. I didn't know that. And obviously, two, if you're invited, and then three is the public input. Um, so I guess you would be, uh, you would get your two minutes or three minutes to say what you wanted. So, uh, Sean Clough, anything to add to that? Did you learn something from that, Sean Clough? Um, um, yeah, you know, the... I, uh, I did it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so, no, it's... Uh, I think that the... Uh, what Rita's explained is is on point, and uh, to the extent that you can name yourself as an ex-official ex member of a uh, committee for the purposes of allowing an individual or individuals on the committee members to speak, I think is, uh, that's, that was news to me. So I think that's, uh, that's, that's great that you've done that, uh, research and that, uh, Riasco was able to help you with that. So that's interesting. So what would we have to do, make a policy or we would just, how would that, how would, how, what, what would happen? How do you do that? Oh, I, 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 you can certainly make a policy so you can ha have a common understanding of what criteria you may employ to determine when someone is appointed as an ex official member of a committee, uh, when, uh, the, I suppose it would be up to the subcommittees who they may invite to speak. Mm -hmm. Most of your subcommittees, I think, are open to the public anyhow, uh, if I'm not mistaken, but there could be some instances where it's not a, a meeting uh, for the public and, uh, <clears throat> At that point, you would either need to be uh, an ex-official member or a uh, invited. So if you had a policy that kind of outlines what the school committee thinks is appropriate in each of those two or three circumstances, uh, then you kind of have an understanding that you can move forward on. So I think it'd be appropriate to have to have a policy as opposed to doing it ad hoc as things come up. Any other questions on this one? Yeah, Patrick, I have one. Sure, so, go ahead. And I'm not sure who to answer this, but in any of the three scenarios, uh, I guess it wouldn't be the three scenarios, but what if we go into where the subcommittee goes into a executive session? How, how would that work? Um, because I take it the, the examples that Rita explained were all in open session only. Yeah, Mike, so uh, that's a great, great question. And if a subcommittee were to go into an executive session, uh, then it wouldn't be open to the public. So that option uh, would no longer be available to a school committee member that wasn't an ex official member appointed or invited to, uh, to speak at the subcommittee. And that's, again, something else that you can uh, discuss and delineate throughout a policy. So um, I guess my other question would be is that if we were invited, because I know you can't have any more than two members of the committee on any subcommittee, but if, could we actually, and maybe I don't understand this completely, but could we actually listen on a executive session, but not participate in the, and that might be for you, Sean. I don't know if I quite understood your your question. If you can listen in on an executive session but not participate, um, I would think if you were invited into an executive session, uh, that would be for the purposes of of having some type of substantive discussion and not just there to to listen. And I don't think that whatever policies developed and whatever rules you create uh, can't be used to create an end run around the Open Meetings Act, all five members uh, still must uh, abide by the OMA for the purposes of not meeting, uh, having a meeting of the minds of any majority of the school committee uh, without having a duly uh, noticed meeting. <clears throat> I'll have to think on this one a little bit more to come back with some more because I'm, I guess, I guess my, my, one of my concerns are is that when there's, and I'm not 
and I think maybe maybe Reader and Patrick might be on the the contracts or the the subcommittee of, of contracts, and I'm not sure. But in for instance, of the, the situation that we just had, we didn't get I didn't get the the contracts until just before a meeting, so I was not prepared for a meeting that came up. So if I had had the chance to listen in and but not participate to know what was going on so I wouldn't be caught off guard like I just was, I guess that's where I'm going with this as far as um, if that gets and, and And this was a, a meeting that was an executive session so the, the public wouldn't have had an opportunity to be present. Is that right. correct? Right. Right. Yeah, I, I think we can kind of when we're developing a policy, whether it works its way through the policy subcommittee, you can kind of iron out uh, these details in order to uh, you know, solve the problem that you, you experienced uh, and making sure that you have all the information you need prior to any formal discussions uh, at the school committee level. So, so Sean, so Mike, let's just say, could get invited to the policy committee. And they could talk about making a policy for this, what we're talking about, right? Certainly. I mean, your policy committee, if, if I'm not mistaken, it's open to the public anyhow. Or so. you could public input, but if it was on public input, it would only be three minutes, right? Yeah, I think you need to treat every, if you're going to have a time limit on public comment, you need to treat everyone the same. So Mike, so Mike what I see is we got three choices. We, we make a policy and, and, we, and we go through all the options that we want and the committee decides what they want. Two, you get invited. Or three, you get public input. I think that's pretty clear to me, unless I'm missing something. Mike? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm listening. I just, and I, and I understand those, I understand option two and three. I guess that, that policy, I, you, if you were invited, public input, or if we make a policy, and I guess what would that policy, how would that policy, um, what would that involve? And I guess that's the discussion that we all need to have, I guess, and how that. Well, you might be invited to the policy subcommittee for your input. And then after that policy is crafted, it would come to the five of us to vote it. Right. Um, and, and, and that's fine. I mean, I don't know what, how you want to handle this. Um, oh. Where you go for, all right, so we're all good. We're good with the, the, the framework of it. So I would say to Patrick? the policy uh, chair, is she on? Yeah. Hi. Holly, would you yeah. like to? I was, I was going to say we could certainly put this in our queue of policies and um, maybe do a little research and see what, if there's any um, existing policies from other committees and how they handle this. And, um, see what we come up with and how we can tackle it. Sounds good. Anything else on this one? So Rita, thank you for educating us all on that and, and, re and reminding us of uh, the resources we have. Yeah, you're welcome. And actually they have a good um, session next week on um, data, understanding data for education leaders. So I'm gonna join in on that one. Yeah. And, you know, it was good when we could go in person and then you could network and meet people, make those connections, but there's nothing like the convenience of being at home on Zoom. So there's that. Yeah, but um, yeah, so that's next Wednesday if anybody's interested. All right. Thank you. So seven two discussion about the implementation of a hybrid in-person option for future school committee meetings. So we put this into effect. We had Hannah and uh, Jonathan. Um, uh, who else? Mariah, I'm sorry, Mariah, Mariah uh, to discuss how we could um, have a in-person meeting. And it seems like it's mushroomed into, we can't depend on Roger Lord forever to tape our meetings. And I see Roger in the attendees, hello, Roger. And uh, so maybe we need to have a, a system that uh, tapes the meetings and we don't have to rely on on, 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 on people uh, on the outside and their kindness of doing it. Um, and so I think it mushroomed into all that. And is, am I on the right agenda item? Yeah, right? Yeah. That's what we're talking about. Uh, so is, who wants to talk about that first? Okay, go ahead, Hannah. Um, 
so as I, I guess, proposed last month at last month's meeting, um, I think it would be a good idea to implement some sort of hybrid meeting for um, at least it will involving at least the five elected school committee members um, with Principal Whip and Superintendent Dias Mitchell in attendance, as well as John Gabriel to handle all of the AV equipment. Um, I think as guidelines are easing, it's about time that we all get back in person. And it seems like there are a few options for equipment that will enable us to conduct a hybrid meeting situation until the governor or the secretary of state advises otherwise. Um, so I'll turn it over to John, I guess, to talk about those two different options. Um, can you hear me? They can hear me at least. Um, so we did come up with a couple different options that um, that will. I mean, I guess we'll we'll talk about a little bit more in, in section nine there too. Um, but basically, uh, what it really comes down to is we want to have we we want to make sure we have a system um, that we'll be able to rely on, but that obviously requires very minimal setup, um, very few uh, moving pieces, so to speak, um, and. Uh, and really one that um, sorry, I should have a slide ready for this um, and and one that uh, that we can really uh, depend on to be able to record all of the meetings. So so what we came up with was either a, a mobile uh, mounted onto a mobile Promethean board, a camera system or, or perhaps in the room in the library itself, a slightly different camera system, um, both of which would be capable of uh, filming the entire meeting um, and automatically zooming in on the people talking. So for those people at home, it would be very obvious um, who is speaking, regardless of um, there's multiple people in the room or if some of us are wearing or all of us are wearing masks, um, it would be very clear because the home user would only see the face of the person speaking. Or if it was a back and forth dialogue, the camera automatically pans out to capture both of those, that, that sort of idea. That also includes um, a dedicated microphone system that we would place in front of each person. Um, so again, regardless of the mask status or anything else, um, we would have the ability to very easily pick up all of the audio in the room and it would sound crystal clear for anybody else. It buys us a few other benefits. Um, we can live stream, we can do it over Zoom. Uh, we could sim simultaneously live stream to YouTube. Uh, we can archive that video footage automatically um, and anybody else could make use of it at that point as well um, or any combination thereof so if if the uh if sooner or later the um, secretary of state releases advice or um mandates that that we have to go say all in person again someday um, we still have the ability to very easily record our own meetings push them out, live stream them if we want to offer it as a public service for, for transparency to make sure the public is informed. Um, and really it's about as simple as pushing a button that says go. Uh, and, and that's really all you have to do. It doesn't require uh, dedicated people to man the system the entire time or a lot of knowledge about it, anything like that. Um, so that's kind of where we're looking at. Um, there's, there's definitely a range of pricing. Oh, and I see Roger has a, has a hand up there. Um, there's definitely a range of pricing on these kind of systems, but uh, but uh, I mean it's it certainly would get as many benefits over time, not just for school committee meetings, but even even for other things that happen around the building for conferences, um, that sort of stuff. Um, and of course, we would be more than happy to have Roger at any meeting. Um, but maybe this would even save Roger from having to bring all of his equipment with him. Um, you're more than welcome to use it with us as well. Um, but let me. Are you going to bring? Uh, can I guess what Roger's going to say? Hey, bring him in. Go ahead. Bring him in. He's going to say, go for it. That's my guess. Let's see if I'm right. All right. Well, you should be online, Roger, if you want to. Go ahead, Roger. You're on mute. And now you're all set. Go ahead. Okay. You can hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Go for it. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> Actually, you know, there's a number of outlets for people to uh, watch the school committee meeting or attend it, whatever the case may be. Is YouTube there's watching it online like I'm doing right now. Uh, but there's one option that many people in Little Compton uh, take, which is to watch it on television. And by that, I mean the Cox channel that's used, channel 18, for playing Little Compton uh, videos for town council, budget committee and school committee. And that's what I am doing right now. I'm recording this meeting 
as, as it's taking place. My next step will be tonight uh, after it's done is to create a playable DVD and then bring that over to the Cox place in Portsmouth. And they usually play it uh, either Friday or Saturday, but typically on Monday and Tuesday. So it's part of, I've heard everything that you said, but that's the one piece that you did not address. And that's what I'm doing right now. I don't mind doing it. If you want to do it, there's nothing to stop you from making DVDs that can be dropped off at Cox uh, or that PEG office in Portsmouth. Uh, but I really don't mind doing it. And it basically forces me to watch a school committee meeting, uh, which I might not do otherwise. Uh, so aside from that, that's my two cents. No, and, and Roger, oh. if you can erase some of my wrinkles from the pandemic before you drop it off at Cox, thank you. I do that on a regular basis. Awesome, thanks so much. <laughs> no, and, and that's definitely an important public service and, and you're right, I shouldn't have left that out. Um, I definitely do appreciate the fact that you do all that, um, but I, I might even be able to help you um, a little bit, Roger, because we do store copies of all of this locally um, as well. So if, uh, if, it would, if it would save you the trouble from having to re-record the meeting or anything like that, I can definitely hook you up with some of that and uh, we can work together to make that as, as seamless as possible. That's fine. And sometimes if for uh, some reason I miss the meeting, I go to where you have recorded it and then create a DVD out of that and drop it off at the Cox office. Gotcha. So Jonathan, I, I've got a, what always concerns me is when we bring in stuff, whether it's uh, for the town, you know, for fields or equipment uh, or, or this stuff, uh, you know, it's all nice and shiny. And, and, and we talk all these rosary things about it. And then, you know, months go by and, and the year go by, who's going to maintain it? Uh, maintenance is a huge word in this town because, you know, who's going to do the back end of it? Who's going to maintain it? You know, how, how's that going to work? So maintenance is definitely something that I look at first in any of these kind of situations. Um, and it really depends on, on what we, we make our final decision um, to be or so to speak. Um, for the most part, it is very maintenance free. Um, it's, it's the kind of solution that can go in a small suitcase and be moved around if, if that's the desired outcome. Um, and it's, it's very, very simple as far as knowing how to use it. Um, it doesn't require a lot of training or anything like that. It's as simple as plugging a single cable into any computer you're running a meeting or doing a recording on and it presents itself like a webcam. So much like you would, um, yeah, just, just plug in a webcam for a call like this. Um, it, it works the exact same way. There's a, there's a controller built into the camera that handles all the different microphones and mixing all the audio together so it sounds perfect and all that good stuff. Um, if we wanna take it a, a little step further, we can actually integrate it into a room itself. So if we know we'll always meet in the library or always meet in the commons or whatever makes the most sense for, for social distancing requirements and all that, um, we can ceiling mount those microphones. We can permanently wall mount that camera. Um, and it's still, we, we can do it in a way that is still very easy to use. Um, we can even have a dedicated machine there. So in terms of actually utilizing it in a day-to-day -day basis or for meetings or for any other reason you can think of, um, like I said, it's, it's really just as simple as starting the Zoom call on that machine or, or plugging your USB cable in and hitting that go button. Um, so very, very minimal dedicated skills required in that scenario. Yeah, so it might be might be um, advantageous to get a couple people in, in the school to be able to do that, you know, instead of just letting it fall on one person. I think we, we can definitely make sure everybody does, but I, I think a lot of our teachers and all the skills they picked up this year, yeah. I think they're all very familiar with stuff like this now. Great. Any other questions on this? 7.2 discussion. Um, you got one? Go ahead, Hannah. Oh, Mike, go ahead. I didn't see you. Go ahead, Mike. So, what is the ultimate goal if the five of us were to meet in person? Are we going to let the public meet in person with us at that point? 
as of right now, until we get further guidance, I think that we would have the option for the public and any other participants um, to remain virtual. I think what is important is that the five of us, especially the five elected members, um, are all meeting together in basically, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, just to align better with what the school is doing. And the school has been fully in person for essentially the whole year and it's, they've been doing great. Um, until we're required to have the public in person, I think it, that would be the safest option is to keep everybody except the five of us and those few administrators um, in person. Does that answer the question? Um. No, because I, I guess I don't see the advantage of the five of us sitting in a room where you guys are having problems with feedback and echoing right now, where you're, you're going back and forth with mute. And I understand Jonathan's talking about another system, but what's the advantage of us? Um, and I know there's another thing on here about spending money later on, which I understand it's a different situation, but if we're going to go meet in person, what's to stop the people from coming in and actually participating in the because basically what you're trying to say is that it's important for the five of us to and if i and if i'm wrong please correct me it's um that the five of us meet together as a group so why is that not why is it not important for the parents to uh or anybody in the public to meet in person if they want if they choose as well because well, i think i i think yeah you can answer it after me i think <laughs> no go ahead good Go ahead. Yep. <laughs> um, I think we're having some feedback issues because we're not using um, the system we would be voting on or not to implement further down the agenda. What I think is important, it's not only important for us as a group, um, and I can speak as a new member, which this might um, help you understand it better, that just to have that um, in-person type of exchange where you can read body language a little bit more. Um, I think that's gonna help us work more cohesively as a group, the five of us. And then as far as not having the public involved yet, I think that's still because we're in a pandemic situation regardless of the vaccine rates or the mask mandates coming down. I think to keep all of us and the public as safe as possible, as long as it's available, we should have that hybrid option. Um, and if you were to prefer that public were included, then I think we should just set a limit to the amount of public participants who are able to come in person, and then the rest would be um, able to join online. Yeah, so that's, that's well said. Um, I would just probably make it simpler in my own mind is that uh, I think it is important that, that bodies meet together in person haven't done this since 2014 <laughs> and uh beyond uh, before that it, it is you know you get to chat before you chat after you don't forget things uh you know it, you can see how you're feeling and how important things are to you or, or whatever and I, th I think it's important but for for uh the public to come in we're not getting guidance till june 30th so we'll know more june 30th about the public coming in so right now in my mind I, i'm not worried about the public coming in because we have guidance that they can't. So to me, that's off the table. They're not coming. That doesn't mean that we can't figure out a, a, an option to meet. And that's kind of how I wanted this, why I put this in, in place. Let's get us going, get us cohesive. So when the, you know, the recommendation comes in, the guidance comes in that they can come in and we're all set to go. Um, that's how I envisioned it to go. So I don't know if that helps Mike you, has, any, Mike. Hey, Patrick. Go ahead. I got hands up all over the place. Any, any, go ahead. I'm going to mute. <laughs> go ahead, Polly. Um, I was just going to say, um, I, as much as I was for Zoom meetings and not being in person and staying at home, um, I do think it's time to come together. The, um, the difference between a Zoom meeting and an in person meeting is, um, undescribable. I mean, the, the conversations, the discussion that happens during a meeting is very different. I believe it's more thoughtful and in depth when you're in person. You can, um, there's not that awkwardness of who's gonna speak next, who's got their hand up, Patrick can't see me, you don't wanna cut someone off. It's, um, it's a lot more of a conversation than 
talking to, you know, 12 little faces on a screen and trying to figure everything out. I think it's a lot more meaningful when, when possible. Um, and if I'm well said, Polly, I agree with you uh, wholeheartedly. And I would add that it's also um, a lot cooler in the school library than it is where I am. Um, but no, I, I agree with you. And I would like to add that the Portsmouth School Committee is not allowing the public because the guidance isn't there, but they are meeting together in their library and some wear masks and some don't. Still difficult to understand what people are saying behind a mask sometimes. So my sense is that a lot of school committees are going to this format, this hybrid that you're suggesting, Hannah, and I'm all for it. And I know the technology is gonna be much better. Jonathan's gonna find exactly what we need and it'll be perfect. So looking forward to it. All right, can I just follow up on that, please? Sure, go ahead. So what, just to clarify, what is our guidance right now as far as um, the public within the school? I don't know if that's a uh, Sean Clough or schools. I, I think that's a state, right, Sean? Hasn't the state mandated that or does it go by a uh, school specifically? I think it's the state, I guess. Uh, well, the, the state executive orders from the governor, as well as guidance from uh, the uh, Department of Health uh, dictate, uh, you know, how big meetings of the public can be, so on and so forth. Um, I don't know off the top of my head if they're allowing a certain size uh, of, of public gatherings to, to occur, um, but I, I can't say that uh, in terms of public meetings, what we are seeing right now is that uh, the governmental body, whether it's school committee, town council, they mean they can meet in person, and as it's already been stated here tonight, uh, the public is given the option to zoom in uh, uh, in, in order to uh, avoid uh, crowds that uh, are just too too large for uh, whatever the public health requirements are of this moment. It seems it seems like that our through the guidance that we've received through the state. I mean, as of May 28th, things have been come a lot looser than what they have been in the past. So I'm just kind of confused on the guidance that everybody's referring to is that we don't have guidance. And I understand what Patrick said that June 30th, I guess something's supposed to change potentially. I think I think my understanding, and I'm going to go to the superintendent because I think she she she's on those uh, all those meetings and stuff. But I think that Governor Raimondo had her executive orders and they run out June 30th. And I think Governor McKee has not touched those right. yet. And when June 30th comes, he's going to be forced to touch them. It is odd that he hasn't done it yet, but I don't know. Uh, Lori, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, except um, Mike makes a fair point. As of the 28th, uh, that's the second phase of sort of McKee's reopening and, and relaxing of um, restrictions on uh, capacity when it comes to indoor and outdoor events, but the distancing is still three feet. And so when you invite the public, um, you run the risk of um, sort of overrunning that capacity and you're, you know, you're creating an unsafe situation. So I think that's why most bodies that are um, meeting once again in person um, are sticking to the public um, participating virtually. And I think, and I think the school too, because the kids can't get vaccinated that are under 12 and we have kids running around here that are under 12. So if we're going to pile in a bunch of people, school committee members and, 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 uh, uh parents or wherever the, the public that comes in, they want to be three feet apart. I don't know. Are they going to leave right. COVID hanging around? I don't know. Now, I think schools, it's different, right, you know, for a town right. council meeting where it's different, I think. Right. Schools, um, school staff, things are different for schools. So um, we just got our guidance for summer programming. Now, last year, guidance for summer programming definitely presaged the guidance for the school year. And so the guidance for summer programming in schools is still about distancing and still about masking indoors, um, vaccinated or not. And 
So, I mean, these conversations are coming up in school as well. You know, when the, when the kids are out of the building, can we walk around without masks? And my answer is no. Uh, the guidance is we're masked indoors, unmasked you know, outside, whether we're vaccinated or not. That's the guidance, seven pages that just landed on my desk on uh, Monday. Um, so I'm all for meeting in person. I'm not, I mean, most of us are in school all the time. Uh, anyway, um, and we've had a really good year with our mitigation efforts and so forth, but I don't think anyone is, is ready for the public to come into schools, Mike, whether it's for functions or meetings, um, you know, unless it's those capstone events like, um, you know, what's happening in various high schools. And, you know, Rita got an earful uh, tonight of all of the wonderful things that, Portsmouth High, um, but generally, you know, distancing is still in place in schools and indoor masking and. Um, Lori, I, I'll even add, I'll add as a school nurse, I work in East Providence school systems and I still bring a sick child out to meet a parent at the door. We, we don't even have parents coming in the building. So um, it's still very strict, but it, it, we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there, I think yep. September, hopefully, but the guidance for the summer is pretty close to what is in place now, except for the outdoor mask mandate being lifted and the distancing coming down three feet. Mariah, do you have anything to add on guidance? The only thing I was gonna mention is I, do, I did just put up on board docs, the OMA requirements as far as the executive order that was put into place. It does require that we provide adequate access to public members, um, it has to be streamed basically until um, they have changed any guidance. But as of right now, we legally have to be streaming um, to the public. So that guidance that you're referring to, what guidance is that? What other guidance is there? I mean, I, I guess that's the part I don't understand, I'm sorry. That's the Open um, Meetings Act guidance for during the pandemic the executive order that um, the public have access in some way, shape or form because they're prevented from physically accessing meetings, um, you know, due to the coronavirus. We all had to switch on a dime, uh, town council, city councils, school committees, you name it throughout the state, throughout the country. And um, otherwise we wouldn't be meeting that statute. So, Nothing has changed yet. The way to give um, universal access to all citizens is what we're doing now um, to provide a virtual uh, experience for whoever wants to tune in. But Hannah is, is correct. Um, and so is Sean, it, because I'm sure he, you know, he's representing other districts. Um, school committees are starting to meet in person but they are um, continuing to focus on a virtual experience for the public. Hannah, go ahead. Um, and the guidance that is put out for the public saying basically full swing back to normal at this point is a lot different than guidance for schools, is a lot different than guidance for the Open Meetings Act. And as a school committee, we have to go by the Open Meetings Act requirements, not the general public. Um, and I think Mariah can attest to this too. She mentioned it yesterday when uh, John, her and I met at the school was that our attendance is actually a lot higher now that we are live streaming videos as opposed to when it was in person. So I, I think the only difference between public attendance is gonna really be the fact that we'll all be in one room and they'll be watching all of us together having a conversation as opposed to them just seeing us all in different squares. And that's really where it comes down to it being beneficial for us, being in line with other school committees and in line with what our teachers and staff and students have been doing for this whole school year. Um, thank you, Mariah. Did you have some data or, or some guidelines that you put up? Yep, I just copied the link and put it in the public um, version underneath this agenda item on board docs. 
and page two gives the general outline. Um, From the state. Yeah. Yes. Throw that in, throw that in the chat as well. Um, sure, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Right, and, and Patrick, if I, if I may just, hopefully I'm not uh, beating a dead horse here, but- uh, we're, starting to get, we're starting to get that horse. <laughs> Go ahead, he's not dead yet. But in terms of, when we would say guidance, as it pertains to how this school committee is gonna operate its, its meetings and how it's going to allow the public to participate in those meetings. We are referring to the open meetings law and the executive orders as issued by the governor. First, as you know, Governor Armando and now Governor McKee. And so those, that guidance is the executive order, which the governor is empowered to by state statute during times of emergency, which we still are in one, uh, to modify the law for public safety purposes. And under the law, prior to the, exec the executive orders, prior to the COVID pandemic, uh, having uh, uh, virtual public meetings was prohibited by state law. You couldn't do this. This, if you, if you as a committee got together and said, well, let's just have a virtual meeting because we don't feel like driving down to Wilbur McMahon today. You couldn't it prohibit it. However, that, ex that exception has been made to allow for everyone to stay isolated for the purposes of protecting the public. Uh, be, as everyone has said here, because there are still concerns about large groups and as the vaccination rate increases, right now it is recommended that the public not attend meetings that they continue virtually. And the law, as Mariah pointed out, requires that regardless of whether or not you're gonna have public attend your meetings physically or not, you will have a virtual option because there may be members of the public who are still uh, nervous about attending public meetings in person. Therefore, if they only had the option to choose between their health and attending a public meeting in person, they essentially, you are essentially denying them the opportunity to participate and view a public meeting. So right now, while there's still a public emergency, there needs to be a virtual option for members of the public. And I think it's probably prudent, as it's been stated, that until further guidance and executive orders come out, uh, that it be mandated that the public, 100% of the public participate virtually. And if you so choose as a committee, you can physically, the five of you uh, attend in person, but beyond that, uh, everyone else zoom in. Anything else on this? Oh, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, so Sean, you bring up a very good point just now is that you said that we would not have been able to do this prior to this pandemic and I'm paraphrasing on that, it wouldn't have been allowed for us to do this virtually. And let's just say hypothetically that these emergency um, laws that, that, have been, that have allowed this, say if they do expire on June 30th, where does it stand with this virtual meetings that we are having now? And so if, if they don't allow it after these meet, after the existing uh, orders expire. What does that do for us at that point? Because we have another thing here where we're talking about doing hybrid meetings. That may not even be possible after June 30th. Is that even on the table? So uh, in, in the scenario where an executive order was allowed to expire, you snap back to the law as it was prior to the executive order. So you're absolutely right. If that were allowed to ha happen, then you would go back to hosting meetings uh, on uh, the way we normally did prior to the pandemic. As a matter uh, 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 of practicality, uh, I mean, no one has a, a crystal ball, but I mean, I would be willing to, to bet that these will be renewed in some fashion. It may not be a carbon copy of what is currently would contain with things in the executive order, but something along those lines. Uh, so if you were to, make an expenditure uh, at some point uh, in regards to having some uh, upgraded system 
uh, it's not, I don't think that it would be uh, wasted money by any means uh, if you, but, but that's, again, that's your, your call as a committee. Uh, if you want to wait uh, till the end of the month to see what happens. But I think that in all likelihood, uh, it's almost a, a, a foregone conclusion that this will be extended in some, some manner, shape, somehow. Uh, so I, I don't think you have anything to fear from simply, uh, 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 if you, you don't have anything to fear from these executive orders just going away and you no longer have virtual meetings. Oh, thank you. I'm going to give the last word to uh, Jonathan G. I would just point out one other thing in that um, right now, this is what we have to do to stay compliant. Um, but I certainly think for, for the future, there's no reason we cannot do these things. Um, historically, for the past at least eight to 10 years, we've been recording these meetings, uploading them to YouTube. Roger's been helping us get them on cable TV. Um, having a system that but, but purchasing a system certainly just facilitates getting all of that done and makes it that much easier to do. Um, but just to encourage transparency, to encourage public buy-in in, in what's going on in the committee meetings, uh, I guess why not continue the live stream? Thank you, Jonathan. We're going to discuss. We're going to discuss this on the action items too. So you can have another bite of the apple if anybody wants one. So I'm going to go to eight one public input agenda items and topics. For future agendas, this is uh, <coughs> anyone. No, anyone have uh, any public input? Just raise your hand if you are in the public, and we will call on you. And uh, we'll keep looking if you want to talk. I do have one. It's brought to my attention by Hannah today about survey works. I did not read the superintendent's uh, memo. Um, I did read it. I must have missed it <laughs> about survey works and everyone knows I don't have to go back in time how much I love survey works. And uh, so I would like to have the 2021 survey works um, printed up and you could throw those in my mailbox like I've had every year. I'd appreciate that. Um, and also 19 and 20 year 19 and 20 so I can compare them. That's always something I like to do when I can't sleep. Uh, so if there's any other member that would like copies of the survey works, speak up. I have a hand, go ahead. You want the copy? Yeah. I think we all raised our hands. You asked us, we all raised our hands and you're on mute. I know I'm on mute. <laughs> I'm on mute. Sorry. So it looks like uh, all the members want those on paper. Do you want two years back or just this year, people? Two. I got a two. I got a two. I got a two. All right. I can't see Rita. I have to click over. Rita said two. Okay. And I'm sorry if that's a lot of paper and everyone has to do that. I apologize. Um, Okay, anyone else for public agenda or anything for uh, topics for future agendas? Okay, I'm not seeing anything. We can always uh, raise your hand in, in, the, uh, in the public. Action items 9-1, consider, discuss, and vote to amend the dress code policy. This is a second read. I will go to Polly. Um, so we've made no changes since the first read. This was um, simply to get ourselves up to um, date to um, have everyone um, familiarize themselves with it. Uh, there was a lot of misunderstanding um, from the students and the teachers and parents that there were in the original dress code that there was like a finger length for your shorts and skirts that wasn't even in there and three finger straps that wasn't in there. So um, we did add some things and change some things, um, but those items were not in there at all. So um, we made some, um, we made it clear that the administration is um, ultimately the decision maker on whether something is appropriate or not. And that um, if somebody's clothes make you uncomfortable 
and distract you, that's on you, not on the wearer. Um, so nothing has changed since last month. Thank you. So from hearing that, so if a student is abiding by the dress code and another student is offended by it, um, they can't say anything because they're adhering to the dress code. Is that right? Well, so if they're distracted by it. I was looking for that word, sorry. Yeah, there's some, there's some um, words and photos and um, there are some things that could be offensive to um, members of the school community, even, um, you know, even if they were like a full length t-shirt or whatever, they could still be um, offensive and distracting. Um, and they would be a violation, but it would be up to the administration to take care of the situation and not on the teachers. Gotcha. Any other questions on this one? Yeah, can I ask? I got one. Go ahead, Mike. Holly, can I just have a clarification on that? So just to piggyback on Patrick's, what Patrick was saying. So if, if a student is, how to say this, if a student is wearing what they're supposed to according to the dress code, and somebody else is offended or distracted, there's nothing that we're going to do to the, the student that's following the dress code. Is that correct? Um, Hannah, I see you have your hand up. I'm happy to answer it, but go ahead if you want. I just, I wanted to add that in terms of the student who is being distracted, if it's not distracted by a hateful picture or a picture of drug paraphernalia or something that is explicitly against the dress code, if they're distracted by a female student's shoulder being exposed, then I think it would be prudent that that student be recommended to the guidance department to deal with their um, frame of mind and what is distracting. It's never going to be that student's fault um, who is supposedly the distractee. Um, we're trying to deter from students being taken out of the classroom, their education being derailed because um, they're dealing with a supposed distraction due to those types of things. In the policy, it does say explicitly um, which types of images are not allowed. And those would be, when a, if a student is distracted by that, that would be um, falling within the drug, uh, the dress code policy. I, I guess in, in more in simple terms for me is that we're not going to pick, if somebody's following the codes, we're not going to give them a hard time is, is what, is what I look at it as. So if. Right. Why, why would we, if they were following the rules, why would we give them a hard time? If right. you're driving the speed limit, you're not going to get pulled over. Right. So that's um, okay. I just don't want <clears throat> If somebody's following what we set forth for the guidelines that we're not going to be giving them a hard time because somebody is offended by everything and that they're 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 saying that you know little johnny or, or little sally's whatever they're wearing is offending me but if it's according to what our, the rules that we're setting forth we're not going to be bothering them we're not going to be harassing them we're giving them a hard time is what it might right as long as what they're wearing as far as um written words or photos is not listed in the list of offensive things you you know the the only other thing that i, I saw in this but um and i just need to bring this up so you can refer so i can refer to it is the uh your second page um your second paragraph uh, says one out who laws and guidance direct that paragraph to me seems like that that's already been stated in the above paragraph as well as the third paragraph. And it seems like it's a little redundant to have that in there um, because it talks about it in the top, in the, the first paragraph, second page, as well as the third paragraph, uh, second page as well. That's, I mean, it talks about it in both locations. So I just didn't know why that was also, why we had to add it again. Is there something different? Is there something that I don't see on this? I seem to have lost it on my screen. Hannah, do you mind? Can do you have it in front of you? I do. Um, 
I guess I just don't understand how that's redundant. Um, those were things that were already in the dress code and were put in the dress code um, once the <coughs> started. Um, I think we added when applicable laws and guidance direct because that kind of gives us the room to breathe as Superintendent Mitchell pushed out this week that the mask guidance has changed. Um, that just gives us the ability to enforce those types of public health guidance. Um, yeah, so, I, I just don't see the issue with that. So I'll further explain this. So it says in the second paragraph where it says that they show be required to wear a mask or face covering that's compliant with the CDC state regulations at all times present in the school buildings, facilities, anywhere on school property grounds, unless excused by a medical practitioner. Mm -hmm. So if you go to the third paragraph, it says, it says the same thing in this third paragraph. It actually goes further to say that it talks about how the mask is supposed to cover the face. For example, this okay. would be against the dress code policy. Um, so, and then it goes in to talk about the types of masks that are allowed and not allowed. So I don't see that as redundant. Okay, well. Okay, I think at this point, Mike, if you want to amend this policy, then you go ahead and do that and we'll go for a vote on that. Um, we can do that. Or if you don't want to do that, I'm going to consider a motion to uh, approve this. Would you like to amend the policy, Mike? No, it's all right. Go ahead. All right. So I will consider a vote to amend the dress code policy as a second read. Do I have a motion? No. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Can I have a roll call, please, Mariah? Aliana. Aye. Can I add? Sorry, Hannah, did you? Aye. Oh, perfect. Thanks. Mike Rucha? Aye. Rita Kennehan? Aye. Patrick McHugh? Aye. That passes unanimously. Thank you. 9 2. Consider, discuss, and vote to purchase audio video equipment to host a hybrid school community meeting, not to extend, uh, exceed $4,000. I think we've talked about this before pr prior to this. <laughs> Do I have a motion? Do I have a motion to purchase a video equipment to host a hybrid school committee meeting not to exceed four thousand dollars? I have a motion. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second. I am in discussion. Any further discussion here? Go right ahead. I got a hand from Polly. Um, I'm just curious. I know when we were trying to order Chromebooks and all our other um, technical equipment to um, do virtual learning that we were sort of stuck in a queue of um, everyone else doing the same thing. Is this something that is, we're gonna find ourselves in a similar case or is this stuff readily available? It, it's a combination of both, I would say. Um, some of the supplies definitely have shortages or at least somewhere along the supply chain, the, the manufacturers are experiencing them, but we, we both looked at solutions that were more readily available. Um, and I just don't think at this particular time it's going to affect us as much. Um, so definitely the earlier, the better that we make some of these decisions. Other public bodies will be making the same decision soon as, as different states change their advice as well. But uh, I think we're in pretty good shape. Okay, thanks. The only other discussion I would have is that the Mariah is the one who, since um, I've been around, since she's been around, um, does these meetings. Um, and she's probably going to be the one that's, that's dealing with this stuff. Mariah, how do you feel about these... Uh, uh, this vote that we're going to, is you going to be comfortable with it? Um, yes, I'll be comfortable with anything that anyone asks me to do. <laughs> um, as far as the guidance goes, I think it would be prudent to wait until the end of the month so we know exactly what we're um, going to be implementing, but it seems like we're going to need the equipment at some point. Um, and I really like the idea of transparency for the public and also, um, as Hannah mentioned, the engagement has been really high since we've been um, able to offer a virtual option. I know um, for me personally, my peers, a lot of us are at home at this time of night um, with young kids at home. And so the idea of being able to tune in um, that way is, um, it's much easier um, for the parents with kids at home. So I'm happy to do anything. I think Jonathan is going to make it all happen as far as the technical stuff. 
So I'm, I'm pretty practical usually, I guess. I don't know, but I, I just, I know Jonathan's a busy guy, you know, and he's pulled in a lot of different directions and I don't want this to fall on you or who's ever in your position in the future. So it'd be nice if Mariah, you know, maybe has a backup, you know, I don't know who that would be. Um, but, you know, it, I've just seen things like this that, that, that happen and it's stuck to one person, you know, anyway, that's just my, my crystal ball. All right. I have any other, dis I'm in discussion. Go ahead. I have to see a hand. Go ahead, Mike. Sure. So if we were to vote on this, and approve this, what would the ultimate goal be? What would we be spending this up to $4,000? What would we be looking for? What would we get for our money? What's our goal? Is our goal to have it in just in the media center? Is our goal to have it um, in multiple rooms? What is our goal? What would we expect to see at the end with this? And, well, I, and I, can, I don't, I can... I'm, I'm not just so everybody understands. I'm not against hybrid. I'm not, and I understand that it's the attendance is up. I get all that. I see all that going on. I just want to know at the end, what are we getting? Number one for it, and then number two, this goes back to John McAmey. Where does this come out of as far as the budget is concerned? Since we're already on edge for the the end, with the way we're finishing our budget, is this going to fall into the new year's budget? Where is that money coming from? All right, so we go, we'll go. we we'll go quick. Jonathan, uh, you can give us uh, everything we're going to get, and Mac is going to tell us we're going to get it from the COVID money. Go ahead. Right, yeah, um, so for, for that amount of money, we would end up getting um, seven pod-style microphones um, that can either be put across tabletops in front of people or mounted into a ceiling. Um, we would get a controller system that kind of orchestrates and mixes all of those microphones together and ensures everybody sounds consistent. Um, and, and kind of also talks to the camera. The camera itself is, is a very high quality, um, they call it a PTZ, a movable camera um, that, gets, that either gets put on a table or mounted to the wall. Um, and that camera is between that and the microphones um, and the controller automatically zooms in on the person who's actually speaking at that moment. So rather than see a, a vague zoomed out view of the entire room, you see something much more like what you see on the screen right now, just a, a square, containing maybe that person's upper torso in their head. Uh, and also includes the other little miscellaneous like wiring and, and stuff like that that would be required. Now, um, we very specifically look for systems that are very, very easy to use. Um, so they require minimal setup, almost no, no, no skill knowledge at all, anything like that. And it's just, it's one plug. Um, or if we opt for a more permanent setup, it's, it's zero plugs. Um, and it's literally a matter of hitting the go button. Um, and starting a Zoom meeting. So, so there's very little overhead, very little dedicated people needed to manage that system. So, John, on back to me. Uh, yeah, so we, we have, we'll have money available either through the ESSER 2 or the ESSER 3 funding uh, to cover these costs. Thank you. Mike, go ahead. I know I uh, interrupted me too. Go ahead. That's fine. So basically, I, Jonathan, I understand the, the, the system and how it works. I guess the question was, maybe I didn't explain myself, is that are we looking to just set up one room for this? By you know, I, I, don't, I don't think, you know, I heard you say that, uh, Jonathan, and just my experience from being on the committee, we bounce around a lot. So I think it's hard. It's going to be hard to do that. And in that scenario, um, we, we can talk about a couple of different options. Having it all in, in so, sort of a briefcase is, is still a very easy thing to just take out and put the microphones across the table in that scenario. Um, the other option we would have is to take one of our Promethean boards, like the one in the library here. We permanently mount everything to that. Um, and then when whenever we want our meeting at different locations throughout the building, we just wheel the Promethean board because it is on a mobile car um, into that space. And that becomes where the, the, the device, the meeting is hosted on. So it still doesn't require a lot of manual setup or anything like that. It, it could be mobile very easily if that's what we decide is best. Anna, you want to add something? I was going to ask that maybe Patrick can give us a little bit of the history on this. Um, why are school committee meetings currently held in the library as opposed to the commons? And what would those situations be where we would move around? Number one is if we're going to expect a lot of people. Um, uh, number two, if it was hot, 
Um, if we were having food, we would put it somewhere. Um, what other ones, uh, Polly, that we'd moved around or any John Mack to me might, might have a few. We had to go to the gym once. We had 125 people. We had to do it in the gym. Right. Um, what are the reasons why we would move? I know that we bounce around a lot. We've been in the cafeteria before. Yeah. Um, I think maybe. Oh, you know what? You know what? They had book fair. Remember the, 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 the yeah. commons, they'd have the book fair. We couldn't go in there. So we had to. Sometimes there's functions. It seems like we get we get on a good routine just in the commons there, and then we we get bounced around sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, and I think John spoke to this that there are multiple options that would enable us to be mobile in this technology and to meet the needs of the school committee as well as the needs of anybody in the school, teachers, staff, whoever that needs to use the conferencing um, technology as well. Yeah, executive session, we have to move, even though we don't tape that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, anyone else on this? I have a motion, I have a second. We are in discussion, any further discussion here? So I will take a, uh, ask for a roll call vote, please. Polly Allen. Polly Allen. Aye. Hannah Ayer. Aye. Mike Rocha. Aye. Rita Kenahan. Aye. Patrick McHugh. Aye. So that passes uh, unanimously. Thank you. Nine three. Consider discussing what preventing uh, requests for information for administrative and or legal counsel. Anyone? I'm not seeing anyone. I'll consider a vote to enter into executive session under RGL section 4246582. A2. Do I have a motion to do that? Do I have a second? Second. Can I have a roll call, please, Mariah? Holly Allen? Aye. Hannah Ayer? Aye. Mike Rocha? Aye. Rita Cunningham? Aye. Patrick McHugh? Aye. All right. We'll see everybody in executive. Then we will come back out and report out if any votes are taken. See y'all in there. Uh, Mar uh, Mariah. Make sure Clough gets in. Yeah, is there, a, is there a link you might be able to just forward me? I don't think I have the link to the uh, executive session. Absolutely, I'll email it to you right now. Thank you. Thanks.
Okay, folks, uh, we're reconvening an open session. Uh, 11 2. I will report out that no votes were taken in executive session. I'll consider a vote to seal the minutes of executive session. Do I have a motion? So, so moved. Do I have a second? Second. Can I have a roll call, please? Holly Allen. Aye. Hannah Ayo. Aye. Mike Rocha. Aye. Rita Cunningham. Aye. Patrick McHugh. Aye. So before we uh, vote to address, I want to give a report that a town council member as of three o'clock has resigned uh, their post uh, at uh, on the town council. Uh, uh, June 30th, An Anya Wallach has resigned. So that opens up a spot on the town council to the next vote getter, and that would be me. Um, so I was informed of that today. Uh, so it looks like I may be moving on to the town council uh, by June 30th. So I wanted everybody to uh, know that today uh, since it came out publicly uh, today. So uh, we'll... Yeah, it doesn't matter. You can, they'll have to, if, tra if tra I've talked with Travis Audi today um, and uh, it seems like he's positive that he wants, if I was to go, he was to come on. Uh, it would all just happen. It was a very brief conversation. Uh, so we're all kind of wrapping our heads around it right now. Uh, but I wanted to put that out there uh, today since it just happened. Patrick, I just want to clarify, you, you sort of said he was positive he wanted to come on to school committee. Yeah, it was, yeah. It was a positive response next, or he said yes? That's the next uh, vote getter. You know, it was a very brief conversation okay. and, uh, you know, it, you know, he, we were trying to figure out, you know, what was going on at three o'clock today. I think we'll know more tomorrow uh, when we, we speak again. And uh, we're meeting tomorrow for uh, a great uh awards meeting mm -hmm. so yeah, we'll all be together to be together tomorrow all right if anybody wants to talk with me about it later they certainly can and i will consider a vote to adjourn do i have a motion you have a motion do i have a second second roll call please holly allen aye can i add aye mike Rocha. aye Rita Kennehan. Aye. Patrick McHugh. Aye. All right. Thank you, folks. And we'll see everybody tomorrow for a fun meeting with the kids. Thank you, Sean. A good night, everybody. Thank Hi. you, guys. Good, morning, good night. Sean. See you in the morning. Thanks, Sean. <laughs>